Right. I draw your attention this afternoon to the first verse of John chapter 1. There we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And as we mentioned this morning, that having looked at the attributes of God a little bit earlier in the year, I thought that it may be helpful, maybe even beneficial for us, to consider who the Lord Jesus Christ is, and then after this series, perhaps to look at the Holy Spirit. And so over the, well, over these 12 months that we will look at the three persons of the glorious Trinity. Now let me just say from the very beginning that everything that we want to say concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, both today and in the weeks to come, it will be based upon what the Bible reveals about him. And I say that because we, we affirm that the Bible is the very word of God, that all scripture has been given by inspiration by God, meaning then that our Bible is a divine book. It is a perfect book. Every word of the Bible is true. This book does not merely contain the word of God. It is the word of God. And I say that because when we want to learn about the Lord Jesus Christ, this book is the source of our understanding. And if the Lord Jesus is not who the Bible says he is, well then we are fools to believe in him. That means I will have been nothing less than a fool for all these years that I have preached about him. If the Lord Jesus is not who the Bible says he is, then all that I've done uh, from the age of 19 onwards has been in vain. I'll have been a fool to become a minister. when I could have had a job where I clocked in at 9 o'clock and out again at 5. And without the stresses or trials of the ministry. I would never have had to have worried about my telephone ringing in the middle of the night. Or someone calling me to visit them at the hospital because of sickness or accident or injury. Now, don't misunderstand me. I love what I do. But if the Lord Jesus Christ is not who the Bible says he is, then every visit that I have made, every sermon that I have preached, every move that I have made, every battle that I have fought, every burden that I have carried, every mile that I have traveled, that has been about the Lord Jesus Christ has been in vain if he is not who the Bible says he is. I will have been a fool to have believed him and trusted in him and preached about him all these years. And you will have been a fool also to have believed in him and served and worshipped him and given your income towards his work and his church if he is not who the Bible says he is. But if on the other hand he is who the Bible says he is then we would be fools not to believe in him. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 we read these words that neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. So we would be foolish not to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and make him Lord of our lives. If he is who the Bible says he is, then he is the only way of salvation. There is no other hope for us but through the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me just make it very clear if it's not already obvious from the beginning that I believe the Bible to be the very word of God. Therefore I believe what the Bible says concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is. And so here's the question that I want to put before you today and over the next number of weeks. Who is Jesus? Who does the Bible reveal him to be? What can we say that the scriptures affirm concerning him? 
The Bible must be our guide in this regard. Because it seems to me at least that you can say almost anything that you want about the Lord Jesus today except that he is God. You can call him a good man, a wonderful teacher, a perfect example to follow. And many people will agree with you and will even praise you for your enlightenment as to who Jesus is. You might go to the other extreme and call him a fool or a charlatan or a deceiver of men. And there will be many who will jump to your side and seek to defend you in what you say and your right to say it. But to call him God is to invite a certain amount of trouble upon yourself. Now I want to begin this series of messages of who is Jesus by beginning here in John chapter 1 and showing to you first of all, first and foremost I might say, that he is the divine son of God. Here in this first verse of John chapter 1, the apostle John reveals for us three attributes uh, that reveal to us that the Lord Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God. Listen to what he says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the first thing that John points out to us this is that the Lord Jesus Christ is co-eternal with God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is Jesus. We know that for a number of different reasons. First of all, in verse 14, we're told that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So John says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In other words, became man. We're looking at the great Christian doctrine of the incarnation. Uh, typically remembered on the 25th of December when we think about the birth of our Savior. Well, John says, we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So the word is the begotten of the Father, literally the Son of the Father, who became flesh. Now, who is the only begotten Son of the Father? Well, passages such as Mark chapter 1 and verse 11 tells us that God's Son is no other than Jesus. At his baptism, Mark 1 and verse 11 records, And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now we also know that the word is Jesus. Again, through the writings of the Apostle John, he records for us in the book of Revelation. He describes a, a time when the, the Lord Jesus will return again in power. He writes concerning his second coming. Revelation 19 and verse 13, he says, And his name is called the Word of God. So when we read here in John chapter 1 of the Word, we're thinking of the one that we call Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. Now, John tells us that he is co-eternal with the Father. He says, in the beginning was the word so he's taking us right back to the very beginning of time or to things as we know it in fact john's words remind us of the beginning of the book of genesis in the beginning and there we read in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth genesis 1 verse 1 takes us back to the beginning and then brings us up through history John 1 verse 1 brings us back to the beginning and then takes us back into eternity past. Now notice what John doesn't say. 
He doesn't say that Jesus was from the beginning. He says that he was there in the beginning. Well, there's a distinction to be made there. When the Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ was in the beginning, it's using what's referred to as the imperfect tense. It's speaking of something that happened in the past that continues on into the present. So when it says that he was in the beginning, it's not that he started then, but when the beginning was, whenever that was, he was there. In other words, he existed before the beginning and he was there at the beginning because he has always existed from eternity past. So what John 1 and verse 1 is revealing to us that at that point that we call the beginning of time, when matter was created, when time was created, when space was created, at that time before there was anything else in existence, at that very time, Jesus was, in the beginning was, the word of God. He was already there. At any point of beginning in the past, the Lord Jesus already was. And John is making a, a very profound truth using the simplest of language. That there never was a time when Jesus wasn't. He was before it all. Before time itself. He is the pre-existent one. He is the one who was in the beginning. What a person to be able to put our trust in. There's no mere man that can exist before space and time and matter. But the Lord Jesus Christ was before them all. He had no beginning. Therefore time does not age him or make him less strong or make him more feeble. Time doesn't change him. Therefore he will not change his mind about you tomorrow or the day after. He is before all things and therefore he is above all things. He is therefore our sure foundation, the one in whom we can trust. And if our hope is for a blessed eternity, what better one is there to turn to than the one who is eternal himself? The Lord Jesus Christ is without beginning. I know that we speak of him being born in Bethlehem, but his birth at Bethlehem was not his beginning. He always has been and he always will be. He is eternal. In the book of Micah, making reference to the incarnation of Christ, we read in Micah 5 and verse 2, and we'll probably come to this text around Christmas time again. But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. The one who would be born in Bethlehem, who would be the ruler of Israel, his goings are from everlasting. Now there are those that would have us believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is not eternal. That he was simply the first of God's creation. Jehovah Witnesses will tell you that our Savior did not always exist. That he was a created being. They name him as Michael the Archangel. They say that at his birth at Bethlehem he became a son of God. Not the eternal son of God. You can refute that. No, in the beginning was the word. The Mormons will tell you that Jesus was the firstborn son of God, the first spirit child of many. They do not believe that our Savior is eternal. But the Lord Jesus Christ is clearly identified here as the eternal son of God. He always has been. He never had a beginning. He is co-eternal with God. Now what else does John tell us here? 
Not only is our Savior co-eternal with God, but he is co-existent with him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So he was not only there in the beginning, but he was with God. So what we see here is that the Lord Jesus Christ is not only united with the Father and that he is co-eternal, but he's also distinct from the Father. He was there with God. So we are looking at two separate persons. So he is both intimately united with the Father and that he is the only begotten of the Father, yet he is distinct from him. So there is an eternal union with God the Father and Jesus the Word that has been there from all eternity, yet they have remained two distinct persons. They are not the same. They do not morph into each other. They are not the same person, just in two different roles. God is not found as the Father in the Old Testament and the Son in the Gospels and the Spirit in the church age. That's how some represent it. That's not what the Bible teaches. In the Old Testament, as well as the New, the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, have always been present. So when we read here that the Word was with God, The word with literally means face to face with God. It speaks of their connection, of the fellowship that they enjoyed from all eternity. That it was sweet and intimate fellowship. The word wasn't simply near to the Father. It speaks of a closeness with them, an indescribable unity with one another. And yet in that unity they are distinct Now, this isn't a new truth. You go right back to the book of Genesis, to chapter 1, verse 26. We find these words, Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. We have unity, God is saying this, but we also have distinction that within the Godhead there is a plurality. It's our image and our likeness and let us do these things. We have the unity and the distinction within the Godhead. This is one of the great and the deep mysterious truths of Christianity. And when the Bible speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ being with God, it's a reference to what we, ref- what we call the Trinity. There is God who is manifested in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And right from the very opening chapter of the Bible, that great truth of the, of the Trinity is expressed, that coexistence of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when we read in Genesis 1 and verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The word for God there is Elohim. And it's plural. It's not singular. So we might rightly read that verse that in the beginning the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit created heaven and the earth. So we're not surprised then when we get to verse 26 that God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Who was God talking to? The Father was speaking to Jesus the Son and to the Holy Spirit who are coexistent with him. When you think of the great commission that the Lord Jesus gave to his disciples in Matthew 28 and verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Holy Ghost. Baptize them in the name, not the names. Why? Because even though they are three, they are one. 
It's a direct reference again to the Trinity. One and three and three and one. Now I know that some will claim, well, that means you worship three gods then. And they say one plus one plus one is three. Well, their mathematics is right, but their theology is wrong. It's not one plus one plus one is equal three. You might say it's one multiplied by one multiplied by one equals one. Even that doesn't work very well either. Our God is a triune God. Manifest in three distinct persons who are co-eternal and co-existent. Now John also tells us something else. That the Lord Jesus Christ is not only co-eternal with God and co-existent with him, but he is co-equal. You notice what it says at the last part of verse 1. That not only in the beginning was the Word, co-eternal, and the Word was with God, co-existent, but the Word was God, co-equal. We've reached the high point of the passage. What John is saying here is that the Lord Jesus Christ was not only in the beginning with God, but that he is God. This is one of the plainest statements in all of the Bible concerning the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's clear from the statement that John is saying that the Lord Jesus Christ is God. The Word was God. And we find that repeatedly through the Scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 Again, in reference to our Saviour's incarnation, his birth at Bethlehem, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shall call his name Emmanuel. You say, what's so important about that? Well, what does Emmanuel mean? Well, we're given the interpretation in Matthew 1 and verse 23. When the angel told Joseph and Mary that I shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. God with us. The prophet Isaiah also said in chapter 9 and verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, The mighty God, the mighty God, the one who was born in Bethlehem, the Lord Jesus Christ, is none other than the second person of the glorious Trinity and God himself. Thomas, when he saw our Savior after the resurrection, affirmed this wonderful truth, my Lord and my God. Paul, speaking about the return of Jesus, says in Titus 2 and verse 13, he speaks of the church that's looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of who? Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 20, we're we're told about the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Word, was God. What do we mean when we call the Lord Jesus the Word or the Word of the Lord? Well, the Word of the Lord is really inseparable from the Lord himself because it speaks of a revelation of God. And we can understand that when we think of our words, how we give expression to our thoughts and our emotions and our will. So when people hear our words, they, they understand who we are and what we're thinking. They understand more about us. Well, God's words express his thoughts, his emotions, his intentions, his will to man. His words carry power. We see that right in the very beginning when God spoke and the world came into being. We see it at the tomb of Lazarus when the Saviour spoke and the dead came forth. The words of Christ have power. So when we say that the Lord Jesus is the Word, we're saying that He is the perfect revelation 
of God, his thoughts, his intention, his heart. If you want to know more about God, we look at the Lord Jesus as being God's word to this world. And he reveals God perfectly. He reveals him perfectly. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, indeed verses 1 to 3 We're told of God who at sundry times, who at different times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed the heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, And the express image of his person. And upholding all things by the word of his power. Did you notice that? The express image of his person. The Lord Jesus, the word is the perfect imprint. The exact representation of the nature and the essence and the mind and will of God. It's not that that the Lord Jesus and his teaching reveals God. He is God. Everything about his teaching, his life, his death, his resurrection, all of these things reveal God to us. In the beginning was the Word. The Lord Jesus is the Word because he perfectly reveals God. Co-eternal. The Word was with God. Coexisted. The word was God. Co equal. Now, our difficulty is that we have nothing to compare this to. There's no analogy or picture on earth that can describe this great mystery. This mystery of the, of the union and yet the distinction between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Every analogy that we make feels in some regard. In fact, every analogy only expresses some form of heresy, believe it or not. And I'll run through some, you'll you'll have heard some of these before. We can't say that the Trinity is like three states of water. Ice, water and steam, solid, liquid, gas, because that illustrates the water changes, forms. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are not various forms of God changing from one to the other at various times depending upon the atmosphere. That's an ancient heresy known as modalism. That God, instead of being three distinct persons, is just found in three different modes at three different times. That's not what the Bible teaches. and We'll see this in future nights. We can't Say that the Trinity perhaps is like a man at one time, a father to one, a son to another, and a husband to a third. Again, that's modalism again, where the distinction of the persons of the Godhead is not maintained. The persons of the Trinity don't merely take on different roles. They are themselves distinct. Maybe you've heard it said that the Trinity is like an egg. You've got the shell, you've got the white, and you've got the yolk, and together they compose one full egg. Well, that's tritheism, and it's another heresy. For God is not one but three separate gods. The shell, the yolk, and the white are all different substances. But our God is one substance and of one essence. And I can't even go back to St. Patrick. And use a three-leaf clover or a shamrock to illustrate the Trinity. That each leaf of the clover represents a person of the Trinity. That's another false doctrine I'm afraid of. It's called partialism. The cloves, the separate cloves that are said to represent the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost together form components of the one true God. Well... That's teaching that they only become God when they're joined together with one another. And again, that's not what the Bible teaches. It doesn't matter what analogy would be come up with. It's not going to be complete. Because the Trinity is 
unlike anything else in this created world. Therefore, it can't be illustrated by earthly things. So instead, we can only really state what the Bible teaches concerning our God. And to that end, the Trinity is a mystery that cannot be fully comprehended by human reason, but can only be understood by faith and is perhaps best confessed in the words of the Athanasian Creed, which states that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding or confusing, if you like, the persons, nor dividing the substance. There is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Spirit, but the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is all one, their glory equal, their majesty co-eternal. So what does the Bible teach? It teaches that God is three persons, three centers of consciousness, Distinct from each other. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. And the Spirit is not the Father. It also teaches that each person in the Trinity is fully God. Not partly God. Not fully God when they're all joined together. But each fully God of themselves. And we're told also that there's only one God. So they're one in essence and one of substance. They are not the same. They do not morph into each other. God is not the Father in the Old Testament, the Son in the New, and the Holy Spirit in the church age. They are all present in both old and new dispensations. They have always been united. They have always been in perfect harmony. They have always been with one another and have fellowshiped with one another. And I know what you're saying, Pastor, can you explain it a bit more? No, no, I can't. I can't. But that doesn't mean it's not true. Our Saviour, as we've seen here in this passage, is co-eternal, co-existent, co-equal with the Father, and yet distinct from Him. He's not something inferior to the Father. He's not an angel. He's not a specially empowered man. He's not a spirit. He's not simply a very good man. He is what the Bible says he is. He is son of the Father and he is the mighty God himself. That's where we begin in our series of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he is the divine son of God. He is co-eternal. In the beginning was the Word. He is co-existent. The Word was with God. He is co-equal. The Word was God. And if we are to be saved, then it is to this God that we must look. Because there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. And so we commend to you Our wonderful God, three in one and one in three. To the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father who elects, the Son who redeems, the Spirit who sanctifies. We cannot be without any of them. I trust that you will commit yourself to this God. And in faith and through grace that you will enter into the redemption that only he can bring. May the Lord bless this word to our hearts this afternoon. And bless us in our Saviour's name. That's prayer. Gracious Father, we thank thee for thy great love wherewith thou hast loved us. We thank thee for the Son who came to redeem us from death and from destruction. We thank thee, Holy Spirit, for calling us in fullness of time and bringing us through faith and grace unto the Lord Jesus Christ in order that we might be brought through him to the Father's house. We realize that these are mysteries that are beyond our understanding. That there are depths here that we cannot even hope to reach the the bottom of. Yet we come in humble faith, believing what the Scriptures teach, that the one who died upon Calvary's cross 
who is none other than the Son of God, the Son of Man. Do bless thy word to our hearts, we pray. And may each who hear the wonderful truth of the gospel, may they come in faith to Jesus Christ at thy prompting and for the glory of thy great name. These things we ask and pray in thy honour and in thy glory. Amen.